That's it. That's it. After last week, I didn't want it, nor did I need it. But after last night, when it hit every single one of you square in the face, now I'm not only going to accept it, but I'm going to demand that everybody stand up on the count of three and yell out, King Amplified was right all along. One, two, three. No, 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 no. Most of you just stood up and yelled that out, and I thank you sincerely. But there was a lot of you that did not speak out with the rest of the group. And I know because I see and hear more vividly than Santa Claus himself. Billy, I see you, little Billy. You claim you hate the Amplified Man, but every single morning you're clicking on an Amplified Man video with your orange juice and your Cocoa Puffs hanging on the edge of your seat and hanging on every word that I'm spitting because you know it's fact and truth. And Jennifer, I'm talking to you. You claim I'm the big bad boogity man. I'm the big meanie on YouTube, but you can't help but click on my video every single time I post one because subconsciously you love the Amplified Man. But you guys are going to try to play coy, play cool. I ain't going to say BC was right, but you know I was. But it's all good. I don't actually need confirmation of that. I know. I'm not seeking the attention. I'm not seeking anybody's adulation. I don't need people to tell me I was right. I knew from the beginning that WWE was incapable of giving us a storyline between Becky and Ronda that we were going to be intrigued with, interested, and excited. I knew that it wasn't even going to get off the ground, let alone last three months. When everybody told me, don't worry BC, the injury that Nia Jax caused to Becky was going to be the best thing. And she'll drop the strap at TLC, she'll somehow win the Rumble, she'll go on the main event WrestleMania in what will be the biggest WrestleMania main event ever BC! And I told you from day one, I was the only one on this platform, the only one, the only one on this platform with a brain in their skull who speaks common sense with logic and knows what the fuck they're talking about, because I promise you, there is not one other son of a bitch on this platform that knows what he's talking about. Not one! And I've seen them all! I'm the only one from day one that told you that just because they're women does not mean they should be main eventing. Just because Becky Lynch is as over as she's ever been and she gets Becky chance does not mean this should be the main event because WWE has a problem with not building shit. But instead, they tear it down. We are all looking at this Becky Lynch-Ronda Rousey match for the last several weeks. We've been all looking at it like it is a joke. We're looking at this like a sideshow in a circus. So how from day one was that your main event at Mania, but after last night, now everybody is saying, Amplified Man, even I doubted you. Even I didn't agree with you. But after last night, everybody has finally come around and seen that even when you disagreed, even when you hated the Amplified Man, I was right all along. From day one, I told you they will fuck this up, to the point that when April 7th comes around, that's not going to feel like a main event. It's barely going to feel like a match on the card. And last night, they throw Charlotte Flair in. So you could say match-wise, it's probably going to be a better match. But how is that speaking main event? How is that settling anything between Becky and Ronda? You told me, you naysayers, the ones that didn't agree with the Amplified Man, the ones that told me to sit back, relax, and watch it unfold, BC, you guys told me I was going to get Ronda and Becky. It's going to be better than Survivor Series. Well, now, jackass, we're not even getting it. This is going to end up being a triple threat match. That's if Becky even shows up. At this point, who knows what her booking is going to lead to. It could be Becky and Nia Jax. Anybody speculating about a real injury? If it is, it's a nagging one like Sasha, and that's why she's not getting too physical. I doubt very much anything under the sun, I would bet, that she's going to show up at Mania. Believe that. 
What is Charlotte Flair? Okay, so the match will be a little better. It's a safety net because then Ronda Rousey, she has a lot more to play with. If she starts fucking up, there's a safety net. Charlotte Flair can always save face. Go with Becky. If Becky and Ronda isn't working, Charlotte, I understand all the moving parts aspects and why they did it. The point is, that's not my main event. That is like a mid-card match. If you're throwing Charlotte in. And more importantly, the bigger issue, you're not settling anything with Ron and Becky. Because it's not one-on-one. -on -one. Monday Night Raw started last night with Becky Lynch in the middle of the ring with Stephanie McMahon and Triple H. And the whole story arc for three hours is Becky Lynch needs to apologize if she wants to be in the main event. And the whole three hours, we're hanging on the edge of our seats, not really, hint the sarcasm there, of Becky Lynch debating if she should apologize. That's your three, that's your badass. That's right, everybody that compares her to Stone Cold, you look like a fool now, don't you? When she slapped Triple H, that was like Stone Cold and Vince. When she took out Stephanie McMahon, that was like Stone Cold and Vince. When she was debating if she should apologize, that was like Stone Cold and Vince. Yeah. Stone Cold coming in with a beer truck. A beer truck! A beer truck king! A cement truck! A cement truck king! A cement truck! A Stone Cold stunner on McMahon. Stone Cold stunner! Stone Cold stunner! And now we have the Becky Lynch apology. I could just imagine Jim Ross's call. Becky's apology king! An apology! Oh my! An apology! That's your epic badass booking for Becky Lynch. Even if she's nursing nagging injuries, that's the best you got for Becky. I'm gonna think the rest of the night if I'm going to apologize. First of all, what is there to think about? You just to fucking apologize, you give a half-ass apology, and then you immediately tell them that no matter who gets in their way, they're snapping their arm and she's ending their careers. So if they want to save their business, they will stay out of her way. So you could have had her done the apology and then went total badass promo afterwards. And I would have had Ronda Rousey jumped her, aligned herself with the authority, and then Ronda Rousey gets to play the villain going into WrestleMania because we already know that's where she's at her best. People hated her in UFC because she didn't shake hands. She talked shit. She didn't take losing gracefully. When she won, she would rub it in. That's what made Ronda Rousey a superstar. And now she's hugging babies, shaking hands, and giving hoorah speeches about going for your dreams and goals. This was the opportunity to run for Ronda, join the authority, get an entourage around her. That way when the rest of the horsewomen come in, you know who the villains are. Play up the heat. This was huge. And this was a chance to let Becky become the ultra face by Ronda turning ultra villain. It was sitting in their lap. And when the three hours was over with, Becky just apologized. And that was it. Ronda ended up showing up, but it was just to look at Becky Lynch with a little smile. Because don't forget, they're buddies now. Because in the Ruby Riot and Nikki Cross match later in the night, they were backstage together. I don't know who thought this was a good idea. Ronda Rousey comes up to Becky Lynch and they're talking like they're buddies who are in a disagreement. Ronda is pleading to Becky, Becky, please think about it. Just apologize. Don't ruin what we could have. It's something special at Mania. And Becky Lynch is sitting there with her pouty face because she's always depressed. Looking like a meek individual, like, I know, Rhonda. I don't need to hear it from you, Ronnie. And Ronda Rousey even puts her, her hand on her arm. Becky, think about it. Or are you just scared that I'm going to beat you? And she walks off, and Becky Lynch is pouting. Whatever, Ronnie. That was it. What the fuck? I wanted the feeling and the vibe that whenever they cross paths, they're going to take each other's heads off. Instead, it's two high school females in the bathroom having a disagreement. So then later in the night, they're face to face again and nobody's throwing bows. They're like friends. They don't want a piece of each other right now. 
So Vince McMahon cuts them off before they can really get in each other's face, which it wouldn't have mattered because they're either going to smile at each other or make out. Who knows? They're not going to fight. Vince McMahon comes out and he says, even though Triple H and Stephanie uh, agreed to your apology, I didn't. I'm the man around here, Vince says. And I say you're suspended for 60 days, which would make it five days after WrestleMania where you're able to compete again. So to take your place... Charlotte Flair. Here comes Charlotte. Everybody's like, oh, oh my God. Wow, this is shocking. Becky's pissed. Damn it, Ronnie. Damn it, Vince. Damn it, Charlotte. Charlotte's grinning because Charlotte always owns Becky. Right? Hey, Bex, I'm taking your spot again. Ronda's like, huh? What's going on? Ronda's looking clueless. Everybody is being booked like a clown. And then we fade to black and Raw goes off the air. The whole three hours, is Becky going to apologize? And then at the very end, it was just to take her out of the match and Charlotte in the match. Again, I fully expect this to become a triple threat match. And what was this all for? And in all seriousness, I don't even want to hear BCU or right all world because it doesn't matter. Because usually when I'm right, it means that something tragic happened, something that we all feared was going to happen, and it actually happened. Unfortunately, I'm always right. I can't even go in depth with this anymore, because if you saw all my videos from last week, the main topic was Becky and Rhonda and how they're being booked as clowns. I really had high hopes, or at least some elevated hopes this week, that they heard all of our cries, and they just made adaptations. They adjusted. Trust me, my hopes weren't fucking sky high. I just had elevated hopes that they made some necessary changes to Becky's character, brought her back to that October-November character that we started to love, September of 2018, the character that was badass, vicious, ferocious, didn't give a shit, and make Ronda Rousey more of the heel. Make those adjustments, and you could give us something that we start to be intrigued with headed toward WrestleMania. And at least the road to WrestleMania would be a lot less bumpy. Instead, they made it even worse. Even if you're going to include Charlotte, that's the way you did it? She didn't even earn it. She just walks out on Raw. She's not even a part of Raw. Nothing made sense. Vince just called up a SmackDown competitor? A, that makes no sense. B, so the Royal Rumble means nothing? I would, as much as I thought it was stupid as hell, Becky still won the Rump, so it's nothing. And again, she'll end up being in it, but the story doesn't make sense. The characters are being booked so tragically that it's hurting them now. I don't know if they're going to be able to recaptivate any momentum at this point. And this is what everybody said should be the main event. How? How is that going to... That's going to be like every other match on the card. So you're basically saying it's got to be the main event just because it's women. That's what we're saying, right? Because the match isn't doing shit for me. Maybe that's a main event at Battleground. Ronda versus Becky one-on-one -on -one is what it should have been. And if being booked like it has been, then I will... Fully admit, it should not be in the main event. But it absolutely should be on WrestleMania, Becky versus Ronda. It could be one of the main events. I don't see it going on last. But now we're not even getting one-on-one. -on -one. So all of this beef, all of the dropping of the title at TLC, winning the Rumble just to get back to Ronnie, was for nothing! It's just a triple threat now! Charlotte could have won the Rumble, Becky could have squeezed her way at Elimination Chamber of Fastlane, and it all would have been the same anyway. So what the fuck did she have to tap out the Asuka and beg her way into the Rumble for? I, I, I hope this is... I hope you guys are comprehending what I'm saying because I said it all of last week too and now we have another night of even worse booking between these ladies and we still don't know what Asuka has! Who's ready for Asuka? Nobody because there's nobody left. On SmackDown, Mandy Rose, Sonya Deville, Lana, Carmella? Who's Asuka's main event 
Or, or, or big matchup ma a mania, I should say. Naomi would be the only one. That's the only other remaining SmackDown ladies. Unless they skyrocket Io Shirai or Kairi Sane really quick. I don't see. Asuka now is just, hey, you might as well add her, add Lana, add Carmella, add everybody. Make this a fatal 10-way main event. Fuck it. It's already a circus. This is bullshit. The, 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 I don't even want to... You know what? That's it. I spoke about this all, in every single video last week. If you want to hear me rant and rave about how bullshit this is, just go to any video last week because I'm done talking about it right now. It is not worth it. They seriously, drastically need to start changing everything about this story in this feud heading into Mania, especially if that's your main event, because this, this could end up being the worst main event of all time. That's it. Cut this until the rest of the show, because I'm fucking done. I, I, I need a coffee. So the only noteworthy topic to discuss from last night's Raw was the Revival winning the Raw Tag Team Championships. The only problem with that is, does anybody even care about that? Of course not. As I said for weeks now, especially last week, if you keep giving the same team opportunities, eventually they're going to win them. So this doesn't come as a shock to me. The only thing that really shocked me is Vince McMahon let them go out and actually wrestle a bit more than he usually does. We always talk about the revival. They don't have a lot of charisma. They're not great on the microphone. They don't captivate you from the time they come out of the curtain, but they can wrestle, which is a plus. Not enough to become WWE superstars, but at least they can wrestle. So Vince let them go out and have a near 20 minute match with Gable and Rude. And they tried to create some magic in the time they were allotted. I think that's the best you're going to get out of those two teams. But it was enough to get a little golf clap. This is awesome. It's hilarious. Even with the revival, it's not a full throttle this is awesome. It's a this is awesome chant with a golf clap. I've never seen that before. Go back and check it out. It's hilarious. Only the revival can get a golf clap this is awesome. And this is what I mean going forward with those straps you better have something big for them because they're not going to captivate the entire WWE bubble. Everybody under the WWE umbrella, what they like to call the WWE universe. From the casual fans to the mainstream media fans to the unregulatory fans, they're not going to be captivated by a team like The Revival. We've seen that from day one. And even having a damn good match last night, I felt... They still get the golf clap. This is awesome. And when it was all said and done, they won the tag team championships. What frustrates me is that it's just hot potato with these championships. In the last several months, I've seen Jeff Hardy and Bray Wyatt with them. I've seen the B team with them. I've seen Chad Gable and Bobby Roode with them. Now I'm seeing the revival with them. I'm probably missing a team in between. Everybody, I think the AOP had the belts, didn't they? I, I don't even know. Everybody has had these tag team championships in what seems like the last six months-ish. It's hot potato. Now, what did that do? The whole formation of Gable and Rude was to hold the tag team titles for a month and a half and then just drop them to the revival in the middle of a Monday Night Raw. That's what I mean about this nonsensical BS that we are witnessing time and time again, week after week, match after match. Titles were something special back in the day that really only changed hands at pay-per-views. And when it was at a weekly show, it was a big news story. Now, that's not even what we're talking about out of the gates. That's secondary, third airy. That's stuck in the middle of the show. Titles don't mean shit anymore, it seems. Just ask Brock Lesnar. He's sitting on his couch or driving his tractor around his farm while there's a pro wrestling show going on that he's the champion of that brand, of that show. Ah, new tag team champions and nobody in the wrestling world even cares. That went off great. Unreal. You talk about the women's tag team championships. They actually kicked off Monday Night Raw match-wise 
and this was a triple threat tag match. The only thing worse than Sasha Banks and Bailey taking on the Riot Squad every week, or Sasha and Bailey taking on Tamina and Nia every week, is Sasha and Bailey taking on both teams in the same match. Because that's what we got last night. More redundancy. Triple threat tag action. Bailey and Sasha taking on Nia and Tamina and the Riot Squad. Great. Sign me up. Also, sign me up to drive right off a fucking cliff. Sasha's still trying to recover from some nagging injuries. So just like last week, that's why you're not seeing Sasha get too physical. Because she can't, guys. She's not clear to do such. So Sasha Banks couldn't really do a lot. I was really impressed with Bailey. Bailey was on her game last night. And again, it's what I always tell you, and I will not steer you guys wrong. I will never bullshit you guys. You're only going to get the truth from me. And I've said for weeks, for months, this Boss and Hug Collection Connection tag team it is only going to hurt them in the long run. I understand they're best friends. They get to travel the world together. They're going to become first ever tag champions, or even if they didn't, down the road, they'll be tech But here's the thing, guys. Sasha works much better on her own. She's a legit bona fide superstar. And Bailey, don't let her fool you. She has not had a great run on the main roster. But she's better than what we have seen. Bailey is much better on her own. We don't need to see these two together in a tag team. All of 2018 and what looks like all of 2019. We don't need to see that. They're incredible on their own. Bailey showed it again last night, just like Sasha did at the Rumble. Bailey on her own was taking on everybody and looking great. Classic NXT Bailey, if you ask me. Sasha Banks was taken out earlier, obviously. Again, she's regrouping from regrouping from nagging injuries. So they had her kind of taken out. She had to go to the back and, and get looked at by medical staff. And it was just Bailey out there. And she almost pulled it off was the story. But in the end, Nia Jax was able to beat her. What that means is Sasha and Bailey at Elimination Chamber are now going to start off the chamber, guys. So that's a severe disadvantage. We expect Bailey and Sasha to be, to be, I can speak, the first ever women's tag team champions. However, if Sasha Banks' injuries are a little bit more severe than even she thought, then maybe they won't clear her as such. And maybe being the first participants in the chamber is a way to get them out quickly. Just a thought, guys. We all expect them to be anointed as the first ever tag champs. And all of this 2018 bullshit tag team was just to get them to the championship. But... Don't be surprised if it's Tamina and Nia walking out of that son of a bitch with the straps. So, if Sasha and Bailey is to do this, to get the straps, if Sasha Banks is cleared in all aspects, medically, to compete, then they're going to have to do it from the number one spot, basically, in that chamber. Should be interesting to see, guys. There's a little bit more intrigue here, at least. You know, how they're really going to run off this women's tag team championship match. Add on the fact that it's inside of an elimination chamber. A little bit in tree, guys. Uh, you know, it's not major, but there's a little bit of, wow, WWE doesn't have a choice here. Usually they're just not creative. They don't care. But they're going to have to be both creative and care in this match this Sunday. Bottom line. Um... And then you went to, uh, it, it, that's, that's, that's the newsworthy topics, guys. That was it. Everything else in this show made zero sense, was boring and cringe as fuck. Everything from Finn Balor taking on Drew McIntyre. Again, I've seen these two in every type of a match, tag team, six-man tag, one-on-one, -on -one, at least 15 times in the last six months. Most notably, Starcade one-on-one. How about tables, ladders, and chairs, one-on-one. -on -one. So at pay-per-views, and then we're just getting regurgitated Drew McIntyre, Finn Balor. But I thought this was the era of change. 2019 was going to be different than 2018. No, in fact, it even got worse. Because Bobby Lashley cost Finn Balor the match, or I should say Drew McIntyre the match, because Bobby Lashley attacked Finn Balor. So Balor wins by disqualification over Drew McIntyre. But this just led to Baron Corbin coming down. And now it's a three-on-one beatdown 
of Finn Balor until Kurt Angle comes down and then Braun Strowman comes down. And then we all knew, as WWE fans anyway, we all know the nonsensical uncreativity that's about to come at us. That's right, get your Teddy Longs out, because holla holla holla, playa, we're getting a six-man tag match. So after a Drew McIntyre versus Balor match I didn't need to see because I already saw it a hundred times, now we're going to get a six-man tag that I've already seen a hundred times. It seems, because it's always the same players. Balor, Braun, Lashley, Corbin, McIntyre, throw in Kurt Angle. It seems like I've seen him ten times in this as well. But here we go again. Right off the heels of Balor and McIntyre, now we have this six-man tag. This match goes on another two segments before we finally get a winner, and it's Bobby Lashley over Finn Balor, even though Balor had his leg on the rope. But listen, I couldn't, I didn't even care if he had his foot on the rope. I was happy this match was over, and then all of a sudden I see another referee come down to the ring and explain to the first referee that Balor had his foot on the rope and they need to restart the match. Of all the times that we're going to get a match restarted, it should be exciting, right? Wow, another referee's coming down. They wasted that opportunity. They could have saved the second official angle that we've seen in the past, but we don't see it often. They could have saved that for a big pay-per-view spot at the ending of a, a big pay-per-view match. Instead, they wasted a second referee coming down to correct the first referee angle. They wasted that in this useless, wasteless six-man tag match. So now we get the match restarted again. So first, I hope you're keeping track. First, it's McIntyre versus Balor. That turns into a six-man tag. After 20 minutes, we finally get winners, but then that six-man tag even gets restarted. So this is three matches in one, and none of them we wanted to see in the first place. Finally, after another commercial segment, we finally got Balor... Braun and Angle winning the match. And I ask you all, when it was all said and done, A, one, what was it all for? B, two, did you give a shit? Three, C, did it do anything for Elimination Chamber? Nothing. Zero. Nada. More than three segments dedicated to nonsensical, redundant, 2018 bullshit. And that's the truth. And then you went into uh, Dean Ambrose versus EC3. I've been saying this for weeks. I doubled down. I'm going to triple down. Dean Ambrose is going nowhere after WrestleMania. That's just how I firmly believe. I think everything is happening perfectly. They announced that he's leaving the company three months before his contract even expires. Then he goes on a little losing streak and they zoom in after the matches to show you that he's so pissed off. They hinted that he was going to speak from his heart a few weeks ago. Everything is screaming storyline to me. Everything is screaming work. And I'm down for the ride. This is exciting. It's intriguing. I'm interested to see where they go with Dean Ambrose. So I wanted to see him, if you're going to have him in a match with EC3 for the second week in a row, obviously you have him lose again. Zoom in, show his frustration. This will lead to something big. Instead, Dean Ambrose beats EC3 in five minutes. The problem with this is huge. It's polarizing this problem, this issue. It's the fact that EC3 is still new in this company on the main roster. This is EC3's really second big match on the roster. Last week with Dean Ambrose, this week with Dean Ambrose. Last week you had EC3 defeat Dean Ambrose. So why the fuck, one week later, is he now losing to Dean Ambrose? I know why. I got it. Teacher, teacher, pick me. 50-50 booking. And it ruins everybody. It's the reason Dean Ambrose is even in this position. The first reports that he was unhappy, which I firmly believe are true, and he should be unhappy because WWE booked him like they do everyone else, like a nonsensical joke and a clown. So here's Dean Ambrose getting a win one week, EC3 last week, next week maybe we'll flip it off, and we'll do that for two more months. EC3's already fucking ruined because he's already looking like a loser, just like Nikki Cross is ruined. Nikki Cross has ruined 10 different ways to Sunday because Nikki Cross is coming out every week as a face and then a heel and then a face and then a heel. They don't know what to do with Nikki Cross. She's just a woman on the roster. There's no more good guys, bad guys, heroes, villains. No, Nikki Cross will just take on anybody. 
That's great if that's her storyline, but it's not. They literally are having her come out every week, and they're not telling the story of how she was just the week before taking on the good gals or the bad gals. So last night, all of a sudden, she's a face. Last week, she was fighting the faces. But last night, again, she's a face taking on Ruby Riot. And she's getting her bell rung. Ruby Riot. What is it? The Riot kick? Nikki Cross is down and out like she just got a brick to the head. One, two, three. Ruby Riot wins. I understand Ruby Riot is going on to Elimination Chamber and take on Ronda Rousey. But we all know there's not a chance in hell that Ruby Riot is walking out with that strap. So while you have to make Ruby look strong, and we do want Ruby to get chances in this company because she is really good, that doesn't mean she should be in there with Nikki Cross, pinning Nikki Cross, because Nikki Cross is A, good, and B, still so young and new in this main roster division, on this brand, in this company. All her work in NXT was for nothing. She's already losing, she's on a losing streak, and she looks like a loser. These call-ups, they were grand. Lars Sullivan ends up getting some medical issues with anxiety. He hasn't been seen, not even a promo for him anymore. We don't know what's going on with Lars Sullivan. Lacey Evans, a southern lady, she was a dud from the beginning and hasn't been seen, nor do we want her to be. Or maybe she was on SmackDown and it was that forgettable. Nikki Cross, EC3 already losing. Heavy Machinery non-existent when they are, they're losing. All these call-ups in 2019 that were supposed to shake this division, this company up. 2019, they're all losers. And yours truly said it from the beginning. I'm not even done with the nonsensical redundant bullshit. Oh wait, how about Elias last night before I get to any other stupid... Useless matches. Elias. Elias was in a segment with the Lucha Pinata Party. And there was no reason for this. Didn't even set up a match. Which at least that we're all thankful for. Because that's what we thought it was leading up to. But don't hold your breath. Because they're probably going to have a match next Monday. And the following Monday. And the following 63 Mondays. Kalisto gets on the guitar and starts strumming along on the guitar. The other fucking uh, lucha losers are in the corner. They're dancing. Their pinatas off. And, and Elias wants to do a duet. He says, let me just go get my guitar. And he smashes the guitar over Kalisto. It was a badass guitar shot, no doubt. But when it was all said and done, Elias then runs up the rampway in true heel fashion. So I love that. Elias is a bona fide superstar. It's tragic the way he's been being booked since he started. So I ask you the same question, the theme of this video, what was it all for? I got the answers for nothing. Those are the answers. Lucha Pinata Party and Elias in the, one of the dumbest segments I could have ever seen on my TV. But I can't actually say that because I've seen way dumber thanks to WWE in real life. What they're doing with Elias, is, 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 if there's a word for beyond tragic then that's what they're doing with Elias, because this guy is a superstar. Unfucking real And they give him all this time. That's the, that, that, that's the befuddling part. They give him so much time, and they book him like a clown. Ah, oh, man. So what else do we got, guys? Um, was that it? Now, we went over the main event tag match. Elias, six-man tag. I, I, I'm going to say that was that was the bulk of the show. If there was anything else, Seth Rollins. Okay, I'll end it with Seth Rollins. If there was anything else, guys, it's not note, noteworthy, which was basically the whole show, and it's not worth talking about, which, again, was basically the whole show, but I got to make a fucking video for you guys because that's what we do. But I'll end it with Seth Rollins. Nothing no newsworthy or noteworthy here. Seth Rollins cuts a promo. He wasn't on TV last week. He is recuperating from some nagging injuries, which is what seems like the whole roster is doing right now. Recovering from injuries. I don't even know if they're all injured for real or they just need just time to fucking just stop what they're doing with the stupid company. They're going to Vince and being like, listen, yes, I'm injured. It's called fucking clarity that is needed. I need clarity and I don't have it. 
Everybody is coming out of the woodwork saying, you know what, I'm fucking done, I can't compete tonight. I, I don't blame them. Now, of course, I'm kidding. Obviously, they're all actually injured, I believe. But at this point, I wouldn't blame anybody for just needing some time to just be like, dude, I am not going out there and putting any ounce of my body on the line for this stupid, tragic company. Or place that you call an actual company. It's a fucking circus. Where the fuck was I going with this? Oh yeah, Seth Rollins is in the middle of the ring and he's just talking about what he's going to do to Brock. It was actually decent, nothing wrong with it, but when you have three hours of bullshit, it just fell under the cracks. It's not newsworthy at all. He talked about how he took six F5s and it was the most devastating thing he's ever taken in his life, but the good news is he took six X, X I can fucking speak, six F5s and he's standing there today. And Paul Heyman comes out, and Paul Heyman gives his Paul Heyman-esque promo. He's always kicking ass on the mic, and he did again last night. And he's saying, you, you compare yourself like, like every man is equal, but you don't, you're not stopping to think while you're one of the best athletes in the world, maybe the best, you're taking on a beast, and he's unrelentless. And blah, and blah, and blah, and it was good again, but not newsworthy because it's in a three-hour show that is putting people to sleep. So you're going to have to do better than, than, than just Seth Rollins and Paul Heyman going back and forth on a microphone. That's how it ended. Seth Rollins just told Paul Heyman, listen, I don't care what I have to do. If my career ends at WrestleMania, I'm putting my heart on the line. I'm putting everything that I have on the line because I am sick and tired of Brock Lesnar holding that championship. And Paul Heyman had this look of concern like he's not kidding. And Paul Heyman walks to the back. Out comes Dean Ambrose. And Dean Ambrose gets on the mic and just tells Seth Rollins, I just got one thing to say to you. Slay the beast. And Rollins just smiles like, yeah, man. And Dean Ambrose sits down waiting for his match with EC3. And he's kind of giving a grin back to Rollins. So they're buddies again. Dean Ambrose looks like a full-fledged face again because his heel run was tragic and horrible. So that's where we stand. Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, don't be surprised in the future if we're going to see them tag teaming up. I'm talking legitimately in the next few weeks, maybe the next week, guys, you could be seeing Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins tag teaming up because that's what it's looking like. And you know Vince cannot help but put that those Shield members together because in his mind, that's just who they are. And that was it. That was your Universal Championship storyline going into Mania. Still no champion. And Paul Heyman spewing a bunch of shit. Seth Rollins spewing a bunch of shit. And that's what we got. Somehow Dean Ambrose slipped into the storyline. Slay the beast. Yeah, man. High five. Let's trade baseball cards over some juice boxes later. Okay, let me just beat EC3 real quick. Okay, Dean, see you in the back. That was it. And I don't need to speak anymore about Becky Lynch, Charlotte, Ronda Rousey, Asuka, the whole fucking dilemma. And we're forcing them into the main event because it's their time, BC. They're women, and they've never had the opportunity. Hey, BC, if not now, then when? This is the hottest women's match they're ever going to have in the main event. Yes, Becky Lynch. And Ronda. And Charlotte. And Asuka. And Lana. And Carmella. Let's add everybody in. Mandy. Sonya. Fuck. <laughs> this is a joke. This is a fucking joke. We'll see if SmackDown can save us from this fucking hellhole that we're all in. This road to WrestleMania. We all hit us this huge pothole and we're stuck in this son of a bitch. Can SmackDown get us out of this pothole? We'll find out tonight. And I'll talk to you guys tomorrow for the review and reaction. For now, double fist throughout the day if you need to, if you need to, those Starbucks lattes, guys, because I don't blame you. Whoop some fucking ass. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. For now, I need to fucking decompress from the bullshit, the nonsensical, redundant, garbage, trash, tragic BS that we saw last night from Raw. Thanks, Raw. You're gonna give everyone a fucking aneurysm. That's it, the Amplified Man. Holla at your boy. Peace, cause he's out for now. Check you.